Okay. So my question first, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Perfect. Then we shall proceed. Uh, to get today's lesson, um, going through the blackboard, you guys are section one, which should be the evening section, and now we have to wait for an eternity. Um, in your other classes, is Blackboard kind of screwing up? Because um, I have another class in the morning, a, a different different class, a computer class, and Blackboard has been a nightmare in that. It just doesn't perform well. Which for me is not a big deal, but for the students, it's very frustrating for freshman students to have all this fancy technology not work and they feel if they miss a single quiz that it's game over for them. And you know, applaud whoever scared them in that belief, but that's not how it is. Okay, so going to lesson three. I'll take that and um, transfers across that way. So here we are at the um, content server. And the change I just made works, so the Moodle link for at least this page is gone. And if we go to the lesson description, this is Introduction to Water Man Estimation Principles, including population growth models. Video links don't exist yet. After tonight, I'll uh, post the two videos. And there is a, there's no data link. But there is a spreadsheet that I'll go through quickly in a minute. So in the notes, we have the lesson notes. We'll take that link in a minute. Um, I'm taking the much of the uh, presentation is from Chapter 2 of Gupta's book. You'll recognize this figure. We'll see it again. Um, and um, largely borrowing from what's, what's in this uh, book here. You'll see this figure again. And that spreadsheet would allow you to work these various examples in the spreadsheet and produce essentially the same results. So I would uh, recommend that chapter is uh, for reading it. Remember to use the back button. Uh, there's also a link to a portion of Subchapter of Chapter 290, Subchapter D of the Texas Administrative Code, um, largely uh, duplicates information that's in RG 195. But here it's selected on purpose uh, because I can uh, quickly find, um, or at least this, I was able to quickly find a couple things that I, I want. So we will visit that again in a minute. Obviously, I'm taking these links to check that they're uh, alive and running. Uh, one more reading um, that I recommend is uh, Water Distribution Systems out of the Land Development Handbook. So this is a handbook that's published by a company called Dewberry and Associates. They're a, they're a fairly sizable architectural engineering firm. Um, it does a lot of land development throughout the world. And so they developed this handbook initially for their own internal use and then later published it for everybody to use. Uh, so there's a lot of components that I'll talk about today that are taken from this chapter, namely water use, uh, residential demand, and so forth. So uh, this is another uh, good reading to help support the demand estimation components of a water system design. USGS Circular, I have intentionally delayed, but we'll go look at that in a minute. So if we go to lesson notes, we will take um, part one. It was uh, <clears throat> split into part one, part two, because at one time I had intended to uh, uh, pre-record these lessons, but I never got around to it. Um, 
So this recording that I'm making now, plus this morning's, it will also be linked, constitutes uh, the video for this particular lesson. So when we're discussing uh, water supply demands, the particular uses come, uh, come into mind. Um, and water is used for a variety of reasons. And, and there's three main categories of uh, usage from a demand estimation standpoint. The first category is, is withdrawal. The second category is non-withdrawal. And the third is consumptive. And consumptive is, is for whatever reason, is a subset of the, of the withdrawal category. I suppose there's non-withdrawal consumption, but I can't wrap my mind around that. So withdrawal means that we're removing the water from a water supply source, such as a stream, a lake, or an aquifer, to supply the users. Okay, so no big deal there. We have to do that anyway. But the water is moved a considerable distance to the point of use. So the stream and the user would be miles apart. And, and <clears throat> because it's removed, there's no um, implication or intent that that water will go back to that source anytime soon. So that's what's meant by withdrawal. Not withdrawal are on-site or in, in place uses of water. An example of that would be, imagine, visualize a large reservoir that has a dam controlling it, and it has a, a lock system to raise and lower barges for navigation. So it can raise them up to the pool behind the dam or lower them from the pool behind the dam to the next downstream pool. Um, the uh, water in that pool provides navigation capability. And it doesn't necessarily have to leave the reservoir to provide that service. So that's an example of a non-withdrawal use. That's the water being used for navigation or recreation. So that same pool where there's barges, um, you could be running jet skis or uh, water skiing um, or fishing. Um, a good water skier uh, is, is, is always fun to catch on a fishing pole. Uh, so the water doesn't necessarily have to move anywhere to satisfy its use requirement. Consumptive use is a fraction of withdrawal that is no longer available for further use, at least in the uh, immediate time frame. So that's water that would become incorporated into crops and animals, into the actual biomass, uh, industrial processes, either into the actual product such as soda pop or heat exchange and um, the component that gets evaporated to carry the waste heat away from the process. Uh, with those in mind, let's uh, take a look at the uh, figure from Lucas's book. Um, in that he has this block diagram uh, where this large block that I'm Moving around with the cursor with a relatively uh, bold outline represents a city. Within that city, there are municipal users and industrial users. In the municipal category, there's household or residential. That's, that's all of us in our homes. Uh, commercial, uh, that would be uses in grocery stores and uh, to some extent car washes maybe. Small industries, I guess that's your car wash right there. Uh, commercial would be your hotels, your motels, holiday inns. Uh, and then public and loss. And he has these particular fractionations here um, for, this, for the example in his book. Another subcategory contained within the geographical area called the city are, are major industries. And in that, he has large industries identified. And then thermal power, or the electric generation industry, treated as a separate industry from the others, um, which is probably a correct classification. <clears throat> These two groups, the municipal group and the industrial group, um, we won't worry where they source their water for the time being, 
Uh, all the municipal group is eventually collected and the sewage is treated and in this diagram returned back to the water source. The same is true for the large industries um, through an industrial waste treatment process and back to the water source. Here in this particular instance it's showing that the thermal power industry water goes directly back to the water source without um, any treatment. And that would be, um, that's probably not correct because the water used in uh, electricity generation within the plants um, has quite a few chemical packages added to it to control boiler scale to prevent stuff from scaling on the uh, on the uh, facilities and so <clears throat> it wouldn't be um, ecologically sound to directly return it to the water source but with that in mind we'll continue with the diagram I've included these circles here uh, simply to represent the uh, sourcing for the different categories generally Large industries source their own water, meaning that they don't they don't necessarily buy water from the municipal grid. Some do, but many don't. And part of that, there's two main reasons. Uh, one is that the water quality requirements for industry are pretty specific, and it <clears throat> may be that the municipal water has varying but safe for drinking water quality that is not suitable for industry. So they'd rather source their own raw water, treat it to their own needs to uh, make their industrial product. Um, thermal uh, power industry almost always sources its own water. And uh, one of the things you can see in this particular diagram are the relative uh, proportions expressed as flow rate coming from the <coughs> the uh, river. The uh, municipal one is showing 35 cubic feet per second, which is not a trivial amount of water, uh, is about half what the large industry in this area is using, whatever that is, and that in itself is about half of what's used to make electricity. However, when we look on the return side, um, we lose uh, five parts in 35 of the water uh, to losses never makes it back to the um, water source directly. We lose about 10% um, uh, through the industrial process. That could be evaporative losses. I guess conceivably it could be product water that goes into the final product. And the thermal power diagram here shown is actually quite efficient. We lose one part in 150 and that would be the water that gets evaporated during the uh, waste heat process. And then furthermore, this water source, which is a river, um, there is a, uh, a ability to dilute waste, uh, which is assigned to this particular river. In this case, it's shown about 800 cubic feet a second of the river flow is used to dilute whatever wastes go into the river. And that's a, um, that's a waste assimilation requirement. That's often neglected, not by choice, you just forget about it when doing um, water system design or considering various aspects of design. Is uh, We often forget that that water source is also going to be used as a waste receptacle. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, putting uh, wastewater into a natural system We've been doing it since um, dinosaurs were on the earth. Uh, we just can't overwhelm a particular body of water with too much waste or waste at too high of a concentration. So the municipal, re municipal requirements themselves are related to a number of users. Uh, by means of the relation shown here. The volume required is equal to the number of people P multiplied by the volume per person that's used. Um, so that's, that's actually a fairly dumb equation. Um, 
just says the volume required is the population times the amount per day per person. So that means the population uh, is kind of important. Most of these systems, uh, by statute, are designed for not only today, but for the future. So the reason I have 290 is um, somewhere it should tell us what the I'm not going to be able to find it now. It has a, a statement here on um, service life and that things need to be designed for the present as well as um, for the ultimate build out of the system. There we go. Present and future areas served with population data. So that's specifically in the uh, Texas Administrative Code regarding water system. Um, and that is used to estimate the present and future maximum minimum demands, identify the source, quality, and quantity. So nothing, no surprises here. So we'll take a brief foray, foray into population forecasting as per Gupta's book. Uh, so this chart is a plot of time on the horizontal axis, population number on the vertical axis, and it shows a growth curve. In this particular chart, there's some um, saturation population uh, beyond which the population is not expected to grow. So if you could visualize so what's a good um, and close, but Mexico City literally can't physically move much in any direction anymore. Um, so at some point, there's going to be no way to put more people in there, even if they're standing on top of each other. That's, that's what's meant by saturation population. Uh, that may not be explicitly predictable for many areas, but a, a, a good educated guess can be made. Um, based on housing density, the actual land that you can occupy, um, and so on. Another example might be uh, the Houston-Galveston area. Moving to the west, um, in some sense, it's constrained by the uh, Brazos River, although it's, it actually has spilled across the Brazos. And moving to the east, um, you have the San Jacinto and the Trinity River system. Really can't move much further east than those. They're pretty good sized rivers. Uh, and then to the north, it's kind of unrestrained until you hit Dallas. And then uh, they have a big uh, argument over what, what they're going to call the city at that point. So, so my point being is um, there are certain geographic limitations beyond which a community can't get any bigger. And the housing density would determine what that saturation population is like. So if we had the luxury to be able to plot a population curve over time, um, generally there are three um, portions of the curve that can be identified. Uh, the first is the uh, geometric growth phase, and then there's an arithmetic growth phase where the growth rate is essentially a constant. And then as it starts to approach this uh, saturation, uh, there's a de declining growth phase. And knowing what phase we're in right now, I mean, obviously, if you have the whole growth curve, you're, you're great to go. But knowing if you're in a geometric, arithmetic, or declining phase uh, can be used to make some short-term population forecasts. And this uses the same arithmetic uh, as substrate limited growth that you learn in environmental engineering. So first we'll look at the geometric growth phase. If we're going to do a projection and we think we're in geometric growth phase, or we're going to do projection of geometric growth anyway, and perhaps the other two, and then make a decision on those results, the 
growth model is the population at time 2 is equal to the population at time 1 multiplied by e to the k t2 minus t1, where t2 and t1 are in the same units, and so it's the change in time, in k sub p is the exponential growth constant. As an example, if k sub p was equal to 0 0.03 per year, and time is in years, that's 3% per year, and if we did a 20-year interval, then p2 would be equal to about 2 times p1 with a growth rate of 3% in a 20-year interval. Not exactly, but close. Um, so that's the exponential phase. Then when we're in the arithmetic growth phase, the equation's a little simpler. It says the population at time 2 is equal to what it was at time 1, plus the uh, slope of the growth curve per unit time times the change in time. last one is the um, declining growth phase as we're approaching the carrying capacity of the region. So that's what the PSAT sat means. Um, is the population time 2 is equal to the current population at time 1 plus the difference between the saturation population and the current population. So that's the amount of space remaining. Multiplied by 1 minus e to the minus k sub b times T2 minus T1, where KD is the declining rate constant. And combine these three, and that gives you the, us the ability to uh, project along any point on that um, logarithmic growth curve. Naturally, none of the information is conveniently tabulated. Um, it's in Historical census data, as well as uh, other tools, are used for the short-term and the long-term forecasts. Uh, the U.S. Census makes estimates of, of census values, how many people live in that community every decade. And then in between the every decade, they have elaborate projection models that estimate what the population is between times. If we're working in a region that's been around a while, um, then the plot we just showed might be reasonably straightforward to construct and it might be quite possible to determine uh, if we're in declining or arithmetic or geometric growth phase. Um, when we go to longer term forecasting, uh, the other two techniques that are mentioned are the ratio and correlation techniques and the component techniques. We'll get to those shortly. So, a, why does it do that? A common tool is something called comparison forecasting, and I would think for population projection, this is actually a pretty good approach. Um, we try to identify geometrically similar areas uh, that are now already geographically similar areas that are now already bigger than our area of interest and obtain their population growth curves. And then we um, go to the point of interest of our city. So ours is city A. That's one we want to project. And we take the city D projection, for instance, and we cut it at the current population of city A that we're interested in. Slide the curve over here, and there's the D prime projection, and then we look at the um, city C, slide it over, there's the C prime projection, and city B, we have the B prime projection, and we can come up with an average of these three and use that as the A prime projection. So that methodology is called comparison forecasting, um, and there's some uncertainty involved in that the area of interest may not progress similarly to the path growth of comparison areas. Um, a related uncertainty is involved uh, if the comparison area is selected only based on um, size, both population size and geographic size. There has to be consideration of the um, economic structure of the area. So if we were going to project Lubbock, um, at one time, 
the Houston area had about the same population that Lubbock does now. But it's pretty unlikely that Lubbock is going to follow anything close to the same growth pattern. Um, the economy here is based on different things. Houston has a uh, international shipping port so they can move commerce uh, in and out of the area and they have an intercoastal waterway. Um, they also have uh, the center of the headquarters of major energy industry. None of which Lubbock has or is likely to have anytime soon. Um, I mean, Lubbock has its own industry and it's not going away. Uh, so that would be a bad comparison city, even though at one point in time they had the same population. Uh, there are perhaps other cities that make good comparison cities. And so in the comparison forecasting, selecting the peer areas is an important component of making the forecast. The ratio method, or transposition, is based on the ratio of observed populations of the two uh, study areas. Um, so we have a, uh, a P and a P prime location. Um, and we take the ratio of P sub zero, our current P value, to the P prime uh, sub zero at the same time and then uh, multiply that by the projected population a certain number of years later from the P prime city and come up with a uh, projection for our city of interest. So this P zero and P prime zero are just the ratio of populations at the zero point in time. And then P sub T is the population in the prime city at the new point in time TT is the population in our city of interest at the new point in time. So it's uh, simply a straightforward uh, transposition method. I would argue this is probably actually a pretty good uh, tool for, um, for at least initial um, books and population growth. Uh, another method is correlation, where we would use some kind of ordinary least squares on the populations or log populations to generate a predictive equation based upon a reference population. And so we have a linear equation that might look something like this that says that the, the uh, P prime at time T multiplied by A plus B gives us our projection of our location of interest at time T. The uh, last methodology is uh, formal component modeling, where we would model a population and consider things like birth rate, death rate, net migration rate over a forecasting interval. Um, that seemingly simple equation, P sub T equals P zero plus the quantity birth minus death plus or minus migration times the uh, time interval delta T. Uh, it's a simple looking equation, but it's not a trivial activity. The birth and death rates and migration rates change with time and have to be well documented. Um, if you want a nice introduction on population modeling, uh, this is a book, uh, Introduction to Population Modeling um, by James Fruenthal. And when I was a student, um, he was a visiting professor at the school I was at, and I, I did a very little programming job for him once. So anyway, this was my payment, a really cool book. Um, and it kind of predates common access to c computer methods, so it's all done using mathematics. If we look at the next part, um, going back to our forecasting, so we use forecasting to establish the population that's going to be served. Next, we have to establish what the per person needs are. The components of that include the average daily demand, spelled wrong, um, hourly variation, and fire demand. The 
uh, per capita usage also has some impact on design life and the design life has an impact on the air water usage. Um, design life varies by system component. We'll see a table on that in a second. And maintenance and replacement needs uh, should be planned for the components that will fail within the overall service life. So for instance, imagine we have these two water systems. So this one has pumps in it. Um, getting a service life out of a pump, um, parts are going to probably need to be replaced every 10 years, uh, maybe more frequently, the impellers for sure. So we can use that knowledge or that behavior to design in growth into our design. So we could conceivably start with a small pump and work our way to a bigger one over time. That's probably not the best uh, design process in terms of uh, finances because the uh, cost of the, of the uh, bigger pump at the beginning isn't that much of a delta dollar thing. So here we have two systems uh, moving from right to left. The distribution part of them pretty much looks the same. They both have a service reservoir and then a supply pipe into the grid. And where the change begins is upstream of the service reservoir. So this first one has a conveyance conduit from the treatment plant, various pumps, and they have a river water source and a well field source. So they actually have the luxury of two different raw water sources, whereas the lower one has a single reservoir that's brought in by conduit. Simpler, but also greater potential for failure if that uh, conduit or that reservoir becomes contaminated. But considering those two broad pictures of systems, um, we have some considerations regarding service life. So the source of supply, for example, a river, um, is uh, done for an indefinite period of time. And so we would use maximum daily requirements to uh, uh, see if that water supply is sufficient. With a well field, um, this table shows that it has a useful period of 10 to 25 years. That doesn't mean the water's gone, it means the stuff breaks. That also would be based on maximum daily. A reservoir has a little bit more capability to handle um, uh, daily fluctuations over a year, so we would look at average annual demand. What I'm interested most in this table are these numbers here on the upper level of the design line. So we have 50s, 50s, and 50s. Turns out in the Texas code, that happens to be the implied design life of a water system. So you need to population project for today and for 50 years out and use that to um, design and demonstrate that the system will work 50 years into the future. And although it's quite possible that a population would decline over 50 years, I'm pretty sure no regulatory agency is going to accept a design where you are intending for the population to reduce. Uh, and there's a few other uh, design life links here. So what's interesting here is the uh, expected uh, service life of these pumps. So in this particular table is expecting them uh, to have a 10-year service life. So over 50-year period, we'll be replacing those pump stations five times. That seems like a lot to me, but that actually could be quite realistic. Um, none of this stuff lasts forever, and it needs maintenance and replacement. A, an expensive system could account for these replacement times and use that as a way to leverage finances to uh, build a bigger system over time. And then the average daily usage uh, also has uh, some dependent on the uh, different category. And you've all have done, you all had a quiz and pretty much uh, answered these. Um, so residential use is water for drinking, swimming, fire, sweet street cleaning. And the thing that's interesting about residential is there's usually two demand peaks. So if we look up here in, uh, in um, 
Burning Dragon Tower. Uh, this particular uh, residence has a school dragon wrapped around the apartment building and actually has a fast way to get to the ground floor. As you climb up the little ladder here, jump into the dragon's mouth, and then you water park your way all the way down to the ground. Now, I'm making that up. I just think that's a cool picture. Uh, commercial usage is a little bit is, is uh, less varied than residential use. Um, those are things, for example, are hotels, motels, offices, shopping centers. And then industrial use, we've already mentioned, tends to source its own water. Industrial use is water for fabrication, cooling, refining, and so on, and it depends on the industry. So estimating water use. One of the tools, as an example, is this circular 1200. Estimated use of water in the United States. You notice the date, 1995, 25 years ago. Um, I don't think this has been updated since then. So that's certainly a dated document um, for a water system demand estimation. One thing working in our favor with dated documents is water conservation has been applied um, pretty much throughout the country. So at least for municipal use, it would be a, a reasonable bet that the numbers in these tables are higher than they are today. But there's no way of really knowing them. I want to go to table four on purpose. And so this has, this is what's contained in this um, document is water withdrawal by water use category in the state. So for example, um, in 1995, it was estimated that 3,290 million gallons per day were withdrawn throughout Texas for uh, public water supply. And you, you can see the other categories in the table. So this constitutes a useful tool for making um, uh, water demand estimates. Uh, it also has comparisons to some other uh, regions in the US. So circular 1200 is a good thing to know about. You've seen it here first. Probably not. What it does provide is um, arguably an authoritative source for water use. Um, it would certainly provide a good approximation for preliminary design and enable you to make per connection calculations. And there's the table we were just looking at. Another approach would be to uh, um, use an approximation. So this one I'm uh, showing here uh, in water distribution systems. I don't think this table's out of water distribution systems per se because the uh, font is the wrong type setting. But we'll go look in water distribution systems because we have available to us. And we'll go look at uh, water use or water demand estimation. So here we have uh, public freshwater use. You notice where it came from, circular 1200. And it's already been converted to gallons per capita per day in this uh, table. Um, there's some peak ratios based on population size. So the smaller systems have quite a bit of daily variability. But as the systems get larger and larger, that variability um, gets smaller and smaller. And here's the uh, source. And um, that's an example of a alternative way to uh, estimate water uses. Here's a particular table that has water consumption rates by type of land use. Um, Apparently, all of us each uh, are using 15 gallons a day by virtue of being in, actually it doesn't have a university here, community college, it's got to be the same. Um, I bet you it's down because we're doing this from the internet. <clears throat> and elementary schools where people don't uh, get to bathe, uh, so they have tables like this. I'm calling your attention to that because we're going to see another one in a second. Uh, 
Um, another way of making an estimate would be uh, to ask the question, how much water can you actually get to each of your end users? And so that's, that's a plumber's estimate, because I have it labeled here. And depending on what the pipe sizes are to different connections, um, we have a, a way of estimating the uh, flow rate uh, per receiving structure. So a typical meter to the house is a two inch. And that'll change from location to location, but that's a good guess. So every house in a system um, would demand, could, could take up to 80 gallons a minute. And you can't conceivably get much more into it. Um, and if you, if you do, you're gonna have to raise the pressures considerably. So this is another legitimate estimation technique uh, you count the number of houses you're trying to supply, multiply by 80 gallons a minute, and that is uh, a flow rate based on per connection. Um, you can also uh, take a typical house and count up all the water using fixtures in the house. Assume that they're all on at the same time, so you have teenage children in the house, um, and that, that would give you a peak flow rate that that house uh, would have to be able to take. Compare that peak flow rate to the prior plumber's estimate, choose larger of the two, use that for design. Or if working in a rural system, we can look at another source. Uh, these are the minimum um, flow rates required based on bedrooms and bathrooms. So if you have a six bedroom, three bathroom home, the least amount of water you would want to provide to its 18 gallons a minute. Um, that's not going to really allow anyone to take three. I guess you could take three showers simultaneously. You would use up a hot water tank pretty quick. Uh, again, there's the uh, source of that particular table. And we can also um, look at our RG195, and it has a table like this which should look very familiar to the one that we sh I just showed you out of the water distribution system design chapter of the land development handbook. Um, here they have type of establishment and the various uses uh, per day. So a restaurant uses 18 gallons a day. Most of that is to wash dishes. A country club uses 120 gallons per person today. That's to wash golf clubs, of course. Swimming pools remarkably use less than a restaurant. I guess you get to reuse the water in a swimming pool. And um, so here's some other categories uh, to give you a way of making an estimate. The RT195 publication has several tables, more than this one, um, that would uh, assist in the design or estimation of demand. The next consideration is the daily variation. So this chart is taken out of uh, Words and James, also one of the books that's on the uh, server. And on the uh, horizontal axis, it has time of day. The vertical axis, it has uh, daily usage in gallons per capita per day. Also, uh, the percent relative to the average. Uh, right here. So this peak is at 180% of average. This valley here is about 55% of average. And um, so during the course of the day, it starts at midnight and usage goes down until about four in the morning. Then it starts to ramp up as everybody wakes up, looks in the mirror and tries to wash away the uh, nighttime sleepiness. Uh, they, get, they get to work and there's a decline during the middle of the day. Then comes the afternoon, everyone goes home, then they try to wash off the work for the day. And then in the evening, it starts to decline, and then the cycle repeats. Um, these uses also change with season, the time of year, particular days within a week, and special cases. Um, so my favorite is the big flush at halftime during the Super Bowl. It's a real thing, and in many um, many water distribution systems throughout the country, I, mean, I don't I don't think the operators sweat it that much. But there's a substantial decline in water pressure because of the usage uh, 
during uh, halftime of the Super Bowl. And um, maybe for 30 or 40 minutes, they, they can get um, perilously low pressures from a regulatory standpoint. A formula from uh, Gupta's book for estimating variation within a day. Um, so if you have no supporting data, we can employ this rule of thumb uh, formula. It says that the percent usage is equal to 180% divided by the time in days raised to the 0 0.1 power. So, and that gives us the uh, uh, plus or minus variation during the day. Um, it it's, uh, should be apparent that as <clears throat> the time gets bigger, uh, that variation declines. And uh, the, uh, the chapter in Gupta has several examples employing these kind of um, uh, rule of thumb formulas. And then the next um, demand consideration that is important is fire demand. So fire usage on an annual basis is, is negligible, probably negligible, and should be, because we don't really intentionally burn our cities down. But when there is fire demand, uh, when it's needed, the, there's a lot of water needed kind of quickly, so the withdrawal rate is quite high. Generally, we're required to design and build the system to be able to satisfy the fire demand um, anytime not just when we know there's going to be a fire. And so the service reservoirs and the uh, conduits in the system have excess capacity built into them intentionally to supply the fire flow. Ironically, uh, that excess capacity is largely dominated by fire flow. And um, the rest of the time, it's unnecessary. But because we don't know where a fire is going to occur and when, we have to provide the ability to uh, fight the fire. Uh, and that's generally handled by a statute. Um, the various design documents tell us what the fire flow has to be. So for instance, using the Houston Infrastructure Design Manual as an example, uh, the design manual stipulates flow rate for a fire hydrant, and it stipulates the placing of fire hydrant. So, shall be 2,000 gallons per minute per fire hydrant. Fire hydrants shall be located every 200 feet in the residential area. Something like that. I, I made that up, but um, that's, that's what's meant by statute. In that case, they've made it easy for the designer. In the absence of that, we could appeal to some formulas from the insurance organizations. One example is shown here. This says the fire flow in gallons per minute is equal to 1,020 multiplied by the square root of the population, multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.1 times the square root of the population, where the population is expressed in thousands. Now the 1,020 and the 0 0.01 are derived from their insurance actuarial documents and experience, and, um, um, and there's no first principles involved here. This, these are really a data science result. Our next uh, category is industrial demand, which usually is not supplied by our municipal supply. Uh, but if it's going to, then the industrial requirements have to be estimated and considered. And so depending on the industry, the water usage uh, is different. And it's in weird units. So here it's being expressed in gallons per unit of product. So electricity uses about 80 gallons per kilowatt hour generated, and that water is used mostly for heat exchange. To produce steel, it shows 35,000 gallons per ton of steel. Paper, 50,000 gallons per ton. Textile production, so making t-shirts, stunning to me that it uses um, almost four times as much water per ton of t-shirt as it takes to make a ton of steel. And then uh, coke production, and that's, that's coke, the uh, carbon powder that's used industrially, not coke the drink or coke the intoxicant. It's 3,600 gallons per ton. And the last one in this table is petroleum refinery of 770 gallons per barrel of oil or per barrel of petroleum refined. 
So that doesn't include the, um, the extraction component. Uh, tables like this are available for various industries. It might take some rather um, persistent uh, Google searching to uh, acquire enough data to be able to uh, build a table for a particular industry, but it, it exists. And then the, un the forgotten demand, the waste assimilation. Um, so treated or even untreated wastewater is eventually discharged back into the environment, and it exerts a demand on the environment for its waste to be assimilated. And that needs to be estimated and included in any of our design processes. There's many methods employed um, for waste assimilation. Uh, TMBL is a fairly uh, recent one, total maximum daily load. Uh, dissolved oxygen SAG, same idea, but older technology. And similar modeling approaches by far are the most used ones. We can um, use this equation that's presented here um, as a uh, <clears throat> simple initial estimating tool. And if we uh, look at the uh, equation, it says the waste flow is equal to the stream flow divided by 40 minus 0.38 um, times the percent uh, treatment of the waste. So imagine if the um, uh, waste is treated at 100%. Um, that would mean that we pretty much um, every unit of uh, stream flow would be able to deal with two units of waste flow. But if the treatment is zero, it would take 40 units of stream flow to uh, assimilate um, one unit of waste flow. Right, so this uh, relationship gives us a way to uh, estimate the uh, relative flow requirements that can be satisfied. So if the, if the stream flow is, say for instance, 41 cubic feet per second, um, and we're going to put raw waste in it, we pretty much can put one cubic feet per second of raw waste into that stream and accept and expect it to be assimilated, properly diluted and and safe isn't the right word, but acceptable further downstream. But treating that waste um, uh, greatly reduces the uh, the amount of stream flow we need, or greatly increases our ability to return waste to the system. So that's why environmental engineering was invented um, to get that denominator down to two. One of the uh, last demand categories I'll discuss is the irrigation demand. So uh, this is totally outside the scope of this class, but within irrigation, one needs to consider the fraction that is biomass, uh, the fraction that evaporates, the consumptive use, any losses on the various farms and ranches, and any conveyance losses getting water to irrigation. And the None of these are trivial. One thing irrigation uses huge quantities of water in terms of volumetric sense. They measure stuff in acre feet, whereas we're doing stuff in cubic feet. Um, an acre foot is about 43,000 cubic feet. So that there's a you know, 40,000 times difference in scale. Some of the other demands that may or may not be important in a particular case are hydropower, and navigation, and within those, it depends on whether they're a run a river plant or storage release, and uh, so on. So that um, pretty much concludes uh, what I have to say about uh, demand, and I'll call your attention to a homework assignment, which you have upcoming. So in exercise set three, you're going to do demand estimation. And in that, it has asked a bunch of different questions. So you'll, you'll need to read the various guidance documents.
to find out what is meant by a service unit equivalent, a average daily demand, maximum daily demand. Um, that's in the uh, various readings. Um, and it says use a San Marcos. It says use the San Marcos manual as your guideline. So I, I selected that either to make your lives miserable or because I thought the San Marcos manual had the um, most explicit explanation of these different pieces. I hope it's the latter case and not making your lives miserable. So uh, that concludes today. I will uh, wait a, f a few seconds for any questions, either in the Zoom chat or um, unmute yourself and ask it, and then I will prepare for shutting down for the day. Okay, well that was uh, that's good. So like I said, I was mostly going to talk at you for this one. So now you have got the uh, rapid introduction to uh, water demand. I would recommend that you look through the Estimating Water Demand chapter by Gupta, because it's just good stuff to know anyway. Scan the Water Distribution chapter from the Land Development Handbook. Um, it's a little hard to read on the internet just because it's a scanned image, but uh, you can at least familiarize yourself with the contents of that. And then the um, the design guidelines um, for <clears throat> San Marcos are here, and the Washington State. Actually, all of these, to some extent, have a description of some of those various metrics: um, average daily demand. Um, service unit equivalents and stuff like that. So the purpose of that exercise, this will become very handy for you. And with that, I will say good night to everybody. Thank you for your patience and attention and uh, enduring me during what should be a pleasant dinner time for everybody. It um, will take me, uh, see, it's, we spent about an hour, so take about an hour and 20 minutes to render the video and probably two and a half hours to upload it. So I won't be there till the long morning. And um, I will uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Let's see if I can shut this silly thing off. There we go. Let's stop the screen sharing.